Good afternoon. This is David Eastwood, Geotech Engineering and Testing. How are you doing? Welcome to our webinar here on uh, site development. I got my first question here. It says, from, hello from Karachi, Pakistan. Hello there. I don't know how we, you know, people over there know about this stuff, but I guess that's good. ASE gets all over the place. Let's see. We, what we're going to be talking about today is, of course, environmental and geotechnical engineering considerations uh, for design and construction of site development facilities in Houston area. Audience, uh, we got a lot of people here, a lot of civil engineers, a few architects, um, a lot of site, site development people. And so it's been kind of an interesting group there, some franchise people. Uh, if you need to reach me, uh, my email is de at geotecheng.com. My number is 713-699-4000. My name is David Eastwood. Uh, this presentation is going to be on YouTube uh, within the next few days, so you can just go back and review it. I don't expect you to gain everything and I, you know learn everything I say today in one session. You may have to watch this multiple times, try to figure out what's going on. It's it's just it's just a lot of information. It's a two hour presentation. Uh, if you have questions, uh, click on Q and A on the Zoom deal. Uh, I'm work with the, I work with a company called Geotech Engineering and Testing. We've been in business for about thirty eight years. We do geotechnical, environmental materials, and geoforensic engineering. We got sixty people. Uh, engineers, geologists, technicians. We work all over Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, and we have all rigs so we can mobilize quickly. A lot of these chain stores and stuff, site development sites, you got to be fast and good, you know. And so that's kind of what we tailor to be fast. So that's what they like. Uh, projects. Uh, when I do these projects, you got these buildings that, you know, for these site development sites, some of them are like prefabricated buildings, you know, uh, some of these McDonald's, uh, you got the Chick-fil-A guys going out there, you got a lot of jack-in-the-boxes going on, Walmart, of course, they have built a lot throughout the years, I remember doing Walmart in the 1980s, so a lot of CMU block construction, some of them are tilt wall, but most of the Walmarts are CMU block, Sam's Club as well. Academy, uh, that, that's of course, they're all over the place. A lot of tilt wall buildings for academies, Best Buy, Kroger's. Some of them are CMU walls. Some of them are uh, tilt wall buildings on these uh, Kroger's. HEBs. Again, some of them are uh, tilt walls. Some of them are CMUs, McDonald's here. And service stations here, you can see some of these. Uh, uh, we do a lot of service stations as well. Bucky's, and of course, they're the grand champion of the service stations around the U.S. They're they're going all over the place. They got these huge canopies and uh, apartment buildings, and uh, you know the banks. A lot of this stuff, side development, you know, Hilton, you know, these uh, hotels, you know, dealerships, again, a lot of them are site developments. And of course, uh, and, you know, school districts, they do a lot of site development. All these facilities, they got parking lots, you know, some of them are concrete parking and um, uh, HEBs and Costco. Lows, you know, these are all concrete pave, paving and drives. That's a H, that's a uh, Home Depot, Target. So with all these uh, concrete paving and asphalt paving on some of them, Popeyes, Chick Fil A drive throughs Chick Fil A again, McDonald's parking garages, parking facilities, drive throughs Golden Corral asphalt paving. 
You know, it's the Denny's here. You got asphalt paving. Walmart, they use a lot of asphalt on their stuff. Sam's Club is the same way. Here's a uh, asphalt paving for a Walmart. Sam's Club asphalt. Um, more Walmarts. Here's a Flying J service station asphalt paving. Some of these service stations, they got these uh, truck areas that uh, they use truck service areas and the trucks kind of park there all night. So uh, they have to have a heavy paving out there for some of these facilities. So they got asphalt, you know, this is a Flying J and you got concrete, this is a Fuel Max. Concrete paving, that's a QT, concrete paving. They got to have heavy dumpsters on some of these projects. So you're going to have a dumpster area and storage for dumpsters. And uh, they pick up the trash. They got asphalt and concrete dumpster areas. And these guys have, some of them have big signs, you know. These signs are subject to lateral loading, uplift, and bending. And so we see these signs all over the place. Uh, Taco Bells and small signs, big signs, and shopping center signs, service station signs. So, and then when you start looking at these service stations, for example, they have all these canopies. They're subject to uplift. I mean, I've seen the wind just lifting up some of these canopies off the ground. So you got to have to design these uh, canopies for a lot of uplift loading. Um, then they got the storage tanks out there in some of these service stations that they have fit them up with peak gravel. And uh, they build them. And they have to cover them with concrete. So most of these guys, uh, for these uh, fueling stations, uh, they use concrete, even if they have asphalt paving at the rest of the property, they use concrete uh, paving over the fuel area. It's much more rigid, can span over the soft areas. So detention ponds, you know, again, these uh, chain stores, and they all have these big um, detention ponds. So Home Depot here with that detention pond out there. That's an HEV right there with their detention pond. O'Reilly puts them right in the front. That's a cinemas, Tinsel Town. So what we're gonna to cover today, we're gonna to talk about basic stuff that when you get some of these site development projects, what we have to do. First part of it, they all want the phase one environmental site assessment. On the big sites, we gotta do a fault study. And uh, let's see. Um, trying to see. Uh, got fault study on the, and then you got geotechnical borings and drilling, and laboratory testing, analysis of data. We have a lot of expansive soils in Texas, so we're going to talk about that. PBR as it relates to construction of these. Uh, uh, buildings and structures, the top of foundations, piers, auger cast piles, spread footings. On a lot of the small ones, we just use a slab on grade. Parking lot design, you know, basically uh, concrete and asphalt parking area, dumpster, stabilization, detention ponds, and sign and pole structures, service stations, canopy, underground. Storage tanks, that kind of gives you an, an outline of what we're gonna go through today. Um, side conditions, you know, a lot of these service stations and and uh, these uh, chain stores that, you know, they got pad sites, they, they either buy them in existing shopping centers or uh, they find them, you know, it's a lot cheaper for them to go buy a pad site than develop the whole area. Now, if you're doing a McDonald uh, at Walmart, that uh, yeah, you got to go in there, buy a track, develop it, put detention pond in, and all the facilities. 
but a lot of times they just go out there and just get a corner out there and uh they kind of develop that the area uh, these are some pad sites out there they go into existing shopping centers and and uh build their structures on their pad sites over there at the shopping centers like you go to an existing shopping center like this and get some pad sites they get some of the big ones and the big box stores you know they got sites that are clear that are you can get on a truck on them and then you got sites that's all wet you got to get buggy rigs on them um he's a clear site some of them wooded you got to go out and clear the area and uh so one of the first things we do of course we do a phase one environmental site assessments uh try to make sure that these property that these guys buy you know again some of these companies are national companies they have requirements for a phase one environmental site assessments so what we do we you know if you got an old service stations near their property we go out there and check with those storage tanks to see if they're leaking or they're not leaking if they're look at the tceq uh files texas commission on environmental quality uh instead of texas uh texas railroad commissions epa files see if there's anything with some of these uh barrels or or, or uh, storage tanks that are contaminating the soils and uh make sure all the contaminated stuff is removed if you're building out there in league city out there where you got these uh above ground storage tanks and you're going to put a walmart over here you got to make sure that site is not contaminated and uh as a result of these tanks leaking because once you buy this track here uh you're responsible for all the cleanup costs so you got sites that are contaminated you go out there in the port area uh on two, uh, 225 you go out there east uh, east of downtown a lot of those areas uh they got contaminated soils uh, you got to watch out for pipelines. Some of these pipelines can be leaking and uh, cause contamination. Landfills, some of these landfills are industrial or sanitary landfills. So if they're near a site, can pose contamination. Some of these cleaners can cause uh, contamination and pose uh, danger to some of these tracks. You know, you got the underground storage tanks that can leak and there are cancer causing carcinogens type chemicals can get in the soil and groundwater system and the plume can travel. And if your plume travels under, underneath your property, you're responsible for all the cleanup costs. Old areas, you know, sometimes they go out, tear down some of the existing buildings and put some of these uh, uh, facilities like Walmarts and uh, McDonald's and stuff like that. These are very desirable places to tear down the old stuff and put some of these stuff in in the midtown area uh so downtown so you're going to have to check for asbestos that base paint you got to worry about those things you can't put any kind of a side development over at the uh, cemeteries so uh you can't build out there so it's going to have to move away from there one of the things of course part of the environmental side assessment we look at aerial photos see how the site looked like this is a walmart store 1960 area humble and this is the track right here and uh that's what it looked like in 1989 then they built it in 2005 and now they got all kinds of stuff around it they got the dry cleaner manufacturing facility sam's gas station uh kroger service station car wash murphy's gas station so Here's uh, another site for a Home Depot out there. You can see that's on 59 North. That's the track. They built it in 2002. And they got all these dry cleaners and all kinds of stuff, manufacturing and then the cool tech refrigeration system, auto repair shops near it. So we evaluate the risk of contamination to the site from some of these adjacent facility as part of the phase one environmental site assessments. Uh, this is a track out there in the North Main, out there in the Heights. In the 1925, this site was just had a house on it. And then uh, I think it's 1969, they had all these houses and the service stations at the corner 
when we back when we went back a few years ago to check on it, this whole area was all contaminated. So they had to dig it out and bring in new material in and put structural fill and compact it and take all the contaminated soils to an industrial uh, landfill. Uh, we look for you know well wells oil wells around the site. So if this is your site, you see all the oil wells around it. You know all, when there, whenever there's an oil well, there's potential for contamination and oil pits. So you're gonna have to really investigate sites that they've got uh, oil wells, and you can see the uh, this is our site, and these are all the other things that can cause contamination to this site. It's a risk based analysis. And so, for example, looking at this site, there is about 14 leaky underground storage tanks within one mile of this site, about 12 underground storage tanks within one mile of this site. One of them is within, for example, one eighth of a mile. One is another within one, one, one eighth, one fourth of a mile. So we evaluate these things. So when you do a phase one environmental site assessment, you got to do a site visit, regulatory agencies such as TCEQ, Texas Railroad Commission, EPA files, historical review, interview with people, titles if you need to, if there's asbestos, lead-based paint. You look at that and if there's potential for contamination, you may have to look at what's called a phase two environmental site assessment, ASTM E1903. So some of these places that want to go out there and uh, start construction, you see all this uh, oil and free product out there. And uh, so you got to have to make sure there's no contamination. There's soil contamination and uh, surface water contamination, pipe busting and all that stuff. So you got to worry about damage to wildlife. This is a wellhead out there in northwest uh, Houston in the middle of the forest. There was no record of it with TCEQ. So we had to do a bunch of investigation, making sure it was not contaminated. Remediation, if your site is contaminated, you dig out the bad stuff, contaminated soils, you stockpile them. You put basically some kind of a plastic covering on it. So if it rains, it's not gonna leachate into the soil and groundwater system. And then you put them in a container like this and cover it and take it to some kind of an industrial site. You compact the area with structural fill, eight inch lifts, 95% of standard proctor density. If it's deeper than 10 feet, it should be 100% standard proctor density. And uh, you build your structure on top of it. Wetlands, you know, parts of Texas, uh, you know, especially near Houston area, we have a lot of wetlands. Uh, Brazoria County, Galveston County, Montgomery County, Fort Wayne County, Harris County, we all have some wetlands in them. And they're basically areas that are inundated and saturated by groundwater and surface water. And they, they can basically are sufficient to support under normal circumstances, prevalence of vegetation typically adopted for saturated soil conditions. Wetlands generally include swamps, marshes, and similar areas. And basically uh, they're regulated by the uh, US Corps of Engineers. These are some pictures of wetlands. Got a lot of them in Galveston County. Water used to be up to here, drops. So you go out there to Galveston County, it's a Galveston County deal. This is League City. We developed this track here, we couldn't develop here because there was a wetland here. These are vegetation that grow in a wetland environment. To have wetland, you should have water, plants, and hydric soils. These are soils that are underwater. They smell like rotten eggs, kind of black smelly soils. So you need to have hydric soils, water-loving vegetation, and wetland hydrology, saturation for seven days during the growing season. If there's some water on the property, if you want to know if it's jurisdictional water or not, yeah, again, you can go out there and fill out a short form of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Corps of Engineers, Clean Water Act 404, and just send it in. And uh, typically, they give you a preliminary answer. If you want to go through the whole thing, it takes a long time trying to figure out if you got wetland on your property. Wetland work is done in accordance to 1987 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Delineation Manual. Subsidence, again, if you're doing a Walmart, 
you know, or Home Depot or at Target when you got 40 acres tracks, uh, you're going to have to worry about subsidence and faulting. If you're doing a jack in the box and a McDonald's, you don't worry about subsidence and faulting. Well, you're going to have to worry about flooding, but I'm just saying, you know, a lot of these pad sites already have detention ponds and stuff like that on them. But, you know, again, subsidence is basically is a situation that uh, lowering of the elevation of the land due to groundwater removal or oil subsidence can be, have a wide range of consequences depending on the location of the occurrence in clay soils, clay compaction <coughs> resulting from groundwater withdrawal is the primary cause of uh, subsidence. So if your land looks like this at the beginning and, and the soils are what we call flocculated like this, when you start taking the water out, the land starts subsiding and the soils becomes dispersive like this and the ground starts dropping. So if you start looking, uh, it, you know, for example, Houston area, we got Katy all the way to Galveston. You got uh, basically Beaumont clay formation. It's a fat clay here. Below that, you got an aquifer called Chicote. You got all the way down to Jasper, and below that, there's aquifers there. There, these are the bodies of the sand. You have to drill holes through them, and you pull water out, and use that for drinking purposes. And as you do that, the area starts subsiding. Here's another kind of profile of the Houston area, all the way from Galveston to Grimes County, and you can see the Chicote aquifer here, all the way is Frio aquifer here. Goes down seven, eight thousand, ten thousand feet deep. These are big bodies of sand. You drill holes in them, you pull the water out, and what happens? Uh, and the ground starts dropping. This is a kind of a Goose Creek area near Baytown. Used to be above ground. It dropped almost three feet, so the area is all flooded. You can see Kingwood over here flooding due to subsidence. This is Baytown. It's a wellhead. That's what the ground used to be right in here, but in t uh, ground because of the subsidence, there's a void under the well wellhead because the ground starts dropping. This is the areas that basically go through subsidence. They flood a lot. So you can see the flooding areas. You know, if you look at the Brownwood subdivision in Baytown, this is what it looks like in 1994, 1953. 1978, 1989, 2002, 2012. So these areas subject to flooding. Houston area has subsided as much as nine feet between 1906, 1987 in Baytown area. This is a kind of a recent map that shows Montgomery County as the development going out there in Montgomery County and Fort Wayne County. They're going through uh, basically subsidence. Some of these areas are dropping at roughly about, uh, you know, 16 millimeters uh, a year uh, in Montgomery County and in, in Fort Wayne County. You know, you got 10 millimeters a year dropping almost half an inch. So if you look at some of the areas around Houston, 1992 to 2000 to 2000, Jersey Village dropped two inches a year. 2000 to 2011 in the Woodlands area almost one inch a year, 2012 to 2020, almost one inch a year out there in Katy areas. So, and as the populations in Houston area grow, you know, there's potential for more subsidence in, in the corresponding faulting. Harris County by year 2050 is gonna grow 17%, Chambers County 120%, and uh, Brazoria County 21%. And uh, Montgomery County, 71% is going to grow. Fort Wayne County, 74%. And as the population increases, the more groundwater removal. This is the latest scenario from uh, subsidence district in the potential uh, subsidence between 2010 and 2050 in Houston area, which, of course, promotes flooding. And so you can see the areas of one-foot contours. They're going to drop. This area here, because of all the growth uh, between Fort Bend and the uh, Harris South area, is going to drop one and a half foot. So there is, a, it goes all the way to Montgomery County. 
And you can see this area dropping half a foot. That's why we have water authorities around Houston areas like North Harris County, West, West Houston, North Fort Bend, San Jacinto River Authority. Uh, so these guys provide surface water and we use surface water. If we use surface water, we don't use groundwater so there's less subsidence. Attics area dropping at half an inch a year. Pasadena leveling off because they're using surface water. Faulting. If you got a part of town that's dropping because of groundwater removal and the other part is not dropping, uh, there are cracks in the ground that have been there for millions of years. These cracks become activated. They call geologic faults. They can extend a couple of hundred feet deep. There's about 300 faults in the Houston area, all the way from Corpus Christi to Beaumont to Houston. They move roughly half an inch a year. Some of them become stable and then don't move for a while. Then they become active again. This is a fault going towards this building right there. You can see fault going through this house. This is what we call a shear zone. This is the upthrown section. This is the downthrown section. Upthrown section, downthrown section of the fault. See the lineation going through this house. There's another one in the woodlands. Uh, you can see the fault in here on this house. Build on top of the fault. You can see the fault line right there. Cracking this paving going towards this structure here. Here's a bump right there on a the road. You can see the post oak fault out there north of Galleria. So some of the structures in the area that are experiencing a lot of distress. Uh, on a fault, you got downthrown section. This is the area that's dropping. This is the upthrown section that's not moving very much. So the downthrown section is where the groundwater is removed. These are the clay layer and the sand layer, clay layer. As the, the area drops, they get out of whack in here in the layers. So you can do borings in here, do a phase two fault study and find out where this fault scarp is. That's a phase two fault study. So you can look at aerial photos as a part of phase one fault study. You can see the lineation. This is the downthrown section. That's the upthrown section. The downthrown section is darker because there's more moisture. So it gets darker. Again, you can see the lineation on a fault here on aerial photo. Downthrown section, upthrown section. Fault line right there. And you can see the downthrown section flooded. This is the upthrown section. In sites that are wooded, it's hard to find faults. So what you do, you have to use what's called LIDAR map. Again, here is a grassy area. You can't tell if there's a fault there on the grassy area. So you use LIDAR and uh, basically uses laser light to measure distances. So you got a plane, shoots the laser, gets the elevation change. And uh, you can plot the elevations on your LIDAR map and show where the fault is. So if you got a property here that you're building a structure on and faults going right through it, you're gonna to have to design such that the fault does, fault does not impact your movement on your structure. These are some of the fault lines in Texas. They go all the way from Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, the faults in Dallas and San Antonio and Austin, they're not active, but the ones in Houston, Beaumont's are active. You can see more faults. A lot of fault maps are around. These fault maps are not very accurate. They don't show all the faults. We have more faults in our libraries than are, than are shown on these maps. A lot of the developers do not want us to show faults through their property, so we don't show it on the maps. So we recommend doing a phase one fault study on your projects. A phase one fault study includes site visit, reviewing the fault maps, re reviewing aerial photos, and, and any other information you may have, topographic maps, LIDAR maps, and from that, determine if there's a risk of faulting. These are some of the faults in Houston area, which is on our website. And these ticker marks shows the downthrown section. This is the upthrown section. So if you look at the long point fault in here, it's going all the way from 290 to I-10. And these are the downthrown section. That's the upthrown section.
This is a track these guys were trying to develop out there in Pearland. This is at Makoa Salt Domes. A lot of faults in here. And again, you can see the track right there. It's right there. This is the track that we're going to develop. And there's a fault going right through it like that. So to build on top of this thing here, develop the hazard zone. This is about 130 foot wide. The downthrown section is twice as much as the upthrown section. So the downthrown section could be 80 foot wide. The upthrown section could be 40 feet wide. There's more movement on the downthrown section. That's why it's wider. So if you build a structure on it, uh, it's going to be more subject to movement. These hazard zone, you cannot build a building on it. You can put a road through it. The road may move and crack, but buildings, no. You can turn that into a linear detention or a linear park or something like that. This is a school out there in Pearland. Uh, it's very close to a fault. And uh, the way this thing was built out there, they put them on deep piers. And they got beams underneath the slab so that they can go and level this thing here every once in a while if needed to. Field exploration. We got eight rigs out there. We got these small portable rigs going you know, inside buildings or in hard to get areas. The big areas for deep borings, we've got ATV on soft areas. These goes about 30 feet deep. These uh, the, the portable rig go about 20, 25 foot deep. So if you're going to tear down a McDonald's, we got to go do the boring out there next to existing McDonald's, get the soil conditions. Sometimes we have to work at night. So to get our borings. Uh, it's an auto zone there. We had to do borings there next to it. Oh, uh, you know, again, the same thing, Kroger's, Jack in a Box. These are truck matter rigs, uh, comfort suite, suites, motels, buckies. Some of these buckies are getting old, so they're going to tear them down and build new ones with new models and stuff. Big canopy structures, car washes going there. We also do with portable rigs, inside borings, trying to find out what kind of soils we have underneath the existing slabs. So these are the inside borings. If your sites are, you know, basically really wet, you got perch water table conditions. We have to use buggy rigs. These guys have big tires and they can go into wet areas. So the rig would not get it stuck. Sometimes on the smaller projects with shallow borings of less than 25 foot deep, we use our portable rig system. We pull it behind our ATV and we do the borings with a portable rig. That's fast. You know, we got to be fast on these projects. You can't just wait around. Areas that are wooded, we may have to clear a path for the rig to drive through. Most of our sampling is done with a a, a Shelby tube sampler. These are three inch diameter tube. We push it in two, three feet into the ground and you get a soil sample that comes out like this. That's the soil sample looks like. Cut the ends, put it in foil, give it a job number, boring number, de depth. You put it in a wax box so that it doesn't lose the, lose the moisture. You wanna test it as soon as possible. We typically, you want to test it within 14 days. You look at root, or root fibers. It's very important when you do buildings to know where the root fiber is because root fibers in soils tell you the depth of uh, active zone. So that tells you what the moisture changes depth is in the soil at your job site. So you look for soil for root fibers on your site. The root fibers show the, the depth of active zone. If your site's all sandy, you lose use the standard penetration test. It's a 140 pound hammer, drop 30 inches. That's an STP test. You drive it 18 inches into the ground, six inch, six inch, six inch. That's a split spoon sampler, it's a sandy soil. So if your blow counts between zero to four, you got very loose sand, like you're building in the uh, woodlands area, is loose five to 10. Medium dense, 11 to 30. Dense, 31 to 50. Very dense, over 50. Start going deeper, you're going to hit rock. This is Austin. They got Austin chalk there. You take that all that rock out there and you take it to the lab and you do testing on it. 
number of borings. If I'm doing a McDonald's, a Chick-fil-A, Jack in the Box, you know, in the building area, at least two borings to a depth of 25 foot deep, especially, you know, in Dallas, San Antonio area, Austin, you got to be 25 in Houston, 20 foot deep. Walmart, Home Depot, Costco, Target. These guys, you know, you got to do at least one boring every 10,000 square feet to a depth of 25 foot deep, especially if it's a tilt wall buildings or CMU block construction. For hotels, a little these hotels, small ones, you know, one boring every 3,000 square foot to a depth of 20 feet. These are usually wood frame structures, and so they're not very heavy. Apartments, you know, you do at least one boring per building into a depth of 25 foot in Dallas, San Antonio, Austin area, especially if they're using post tension slab. And uh, so uh, that's what you got to do. And, uh, you know, these are just guidelines. Again, for parking areas, uh, you do basically McDonald's, Chick fil A, you know, at least three borings out there throughout the site to a depth of 10 feet. For Walmart, Home, Home Depot, Sam's, and Costco, Target, you know, one boring every 10,000 square foot to a depth of 10 feet. Hotels, at least, you know, one boring every 3,000 square foot to a depth of 10 feet for, their, uh, for the parking areas. Um, signs, depending on the size of the sign, you probably want to do at least one boring 30 foot deep where the sign is going to go. Canopies. You know, depending on how big they are, if you're doing a Bucky's, you may have to do like three or four uh, borings, but on a typical small canopy, you do a couple of borings, 25 foot deep. Tank storage areas, depending on how big they are, if you're doing a QT uh, service station or one of these uh, fuel max or some of the big ones, you got to do at least two borings, 20 feet deep on the small ones, maybe, you know, just you know, time wise, one boring, 20 feet. Uh, for detention ponds, uh, you do uh, basically Dollar Store, O'Reilly, you know, at least one boring to a depth of 20 feet. Walmart, Target, Sam's Club, Kroger, Lowe's, at least three borings to a depth of 20 feet, 25 foot. Groundwater, you want to know where the water table is when your job starts? Because if you got big box stores such as, you know, Target or, or you know Walmart, they're going to drill piers out there in the ground. So we don't need to know where the water table is. Uh, typically, water table fluctuates seasonally. So if you do borings in the summertime, your water table is deep. And if you go out there in the you know, wintertime, your water table is shallow. And uh, so the way you measure water table, you get a tape measure with a weight at the end of it. You throw it in the hole. When it goes plumb, you hit the groundwater. Uh, perch water table, if you're out there in the Katy Prairie area, uh, Bridgelands out there, go to the woodlands. They got this situation where we got sand over clay. These sands get saturated. Water just sits there. It cannot penetrate the clay layer. So it becomes perch water table. It starts pumping the soil. So if your water just sits there on top of the sand. So if you got a situation where you got a perch water table, you got to have to have a <coughs> special design. For your foundation, your parking areas. This is a perch water table condition site out there in Katy. You're going to have to do special construction for building on top of the perch water table condition areas. Either have to uh, basically open up the area, let it drain, or uh, mix it with clay soils to make it uh, less pumping, or remove it and replace it, or fly ash it type stuff. Laboratory testing. Uh, we take our samples to the lab and do testing on it. One of the tests we do in the laboratory is called uh, liquid limit test. In this test, we add a bunch of water to the soil in this cup right there. When it becomes liquid, you get some of that sample. You put it in this cup right there. 
you got to groove through it when you're trying to handle when the groove comes together you get a sample of that you put it in this cup you get the wet weight of it so we find out uh how much it weighs when it's wet you know the soil behaves liquid and then you put it in your oven and dry it up and you get the dry weight of it and you find out how much it weighs when it's dry the difference between the wet weight and dry weight how much is in the waters in the soil so this th this test tells how much is in the so waters in the soil for it to behave liquid this is a plastic limit test and this test you test the sample you roll it to one eighth of an inch and uh, you try to find out how much water is in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. So you get the dry wet weight of it like this when you roll it up. You put it in the oven and dry it up and you get the dry weight of it. You find out how much water is in that soil for it to behave semi-plastic. If your PI plasticity index is less than 20, you got low soil potential. Between 20 and 30, you got moderately expansive soils. Between 30 and 40, you got highly expansive soils. Above 40, you got very highly expansive soils. String tests, uh, you gotta know what the strength of your soil is. If you're putting your, uh, you know, your building out there, the McDonald's on a slab on grade, you wanna know what the grade beam bearing pressures are, and you wanna know what the pier depths are, the bearing capacity for piers. You do, you know, hand penetrometer test and tour vein test. In a hand penetrometer test, you push this thing into the soil. You can read what kind of a strength it has right there. In a, in a tour vein test, you put it into the sample, you, tor you shear the torsion, you can read what kind of a strength it has here. Unconfined compression test, you got a loading basically ring and uh, deflection ring. And uh, you shear the soil here, you load it up, it's crushing. And you gotta get some kind of a string it has to, for it to become crushed. You get the soil, soil shear strength. You can also run swell tests where we got a lot of expansive soils in Texas. Uh, so if you're building a structure on a, soil, on, on a, a highly expansive soil, you wanna run how much PBR you're gonna get, potential vertical rise. You get the soil, you add water to it at the geostatic stress. How much load is it in the ground? You let it swell and then you let it, you add load to it till it consolidates. And this is basically, this is what we call right here, swell pressure. And this is the amount of percent swell we're gonna get. You wanna have your percent swell usually less than 0.8% in Houston areas and 0.56% in Dallas, San Antonio and Austin. Uh, the way you run a swell test, and you get basically an equipment that looks like this here, and uh, you put the soil samples of this cell, like that in this ring right there. You cover it up. You put it in the machine. You add the geostatic stress to it, how much load is on it on the, in the ground. Then you add water to it, and you let it swell. This is time versus strain. This is the sample two to four foot. It's got 300 PSF loading on it. Percent swell, 1.27%. So it's swelled excessive, excessively. Soil types, this kind of soils we have in Texas are clays. Got a clay site there. Sandy soils, got a beach soils. You got you know sandy soils. Yeah, this is silt. We've got parts of Texas. We've got these silty soils that are grain size bigger than clay, smaller than sand. They're really hard to build on. You go out there in parts of uh, Midland, Odessa area, parts of Houston, <clears throat> Katy area. We've got a lot of silt there. So we have clay. You go deeper, you get orange clay. You go deeper, you get white clay. Go deeper than that, start getting into weathered rock. <laughs> and below that, you get into rock. Of course, rock is a great material to build on. You can build your structures on fill. A lot of the structures are going on fills. As long as the fill is properly compacted, 95% of the standard property density is free of organics, you can build on top of it. So there's no problem, unless it's an expansive soils, which may have to be modified or removed and replaced if you want to build on top of it. 
when you have highly expansive soils, you're going to develop shrinkage cracks. So this shrinkage cracks, what happens is with time, these shrinkage cracks get filled up with debris. And when the soil is dry, they get filled up and then we get a big rain and the soil wants to swell up. It doesn't have any place to go. It uh, basically shears the clay soils at 45 degree angle, they call slick insides. And so what happens is if you were to put your pier in the ground and you got slick insided soils, you're gonna get a lot of collapsing of the clay soils. Engineering analysis, if you're building in Texas, you got a lot of expansive soils in Texas and Louisiana. And so you got this, of course, Texas got variable soil conditions. So if you do any of these box stores or these franchises, make sure you do a soil test for them. Make sure that, you know, we know what kind of soils they have, design a proper foundation on it. These are the soil types and they expand up to 1500% through Texas, through te throughout the U.S. This is done by the uh, basically U.S. Corps of Engineers. So we got a lot of expansive soils in the U.S. Texas and Louisiana, where the expansive soils are the red areas. A lot of expansive soils. These soils experience a lot of shrink swell problems. So if you're building in Dallas, San Antonio, Houston area, in Austin, we have a lot of expansive soils. Areas like Lubbock, Lubbock El Paso, Midland, Odessa, they don't have any expansive soils. So we got the bad soils. And then we got north of Buffalo Bayou in Houston, your soils are sandy, south of Buffalo Bayou, you got Beaumont formation, your soils are gumbo. So if you go around Houston area, starting from Roman Forest, you know, kind of near where I live out here, you got sandy silt and uh, sand, clayey sand type material. Then you go to Kingwood, you got some areas really sandy soil, some areas are highly expensive, gumbo clay. You go to Tascosita, you got perch water table conditions, you got sand over clay. You go to Channel View, Galena Park, Baytown, Laporte, Seabrook, San Leon, East Bay, uh, Anahuac, South Houston, Pearland, Fernswood, Missouri City, Sugarland, New Territory, Pecan Grove, Rosenberg, and all the way down here, Wharton, they all have highly expensive soils out here. You start going out there on the west side, Katy out there, Brookshire area, you got sandy soils. Now you go out there to Fulcher, you got to be careful when you're building stuff in Fulcher. You got tricky soils. Some areas are sandy. Some areas are clay. Uh, just a lot of foundation problems in that area. Bridgeland areas, you got sandy clay soils out there. Fairfield, you got clayey sand and sandy clays. Tomball, you got kind of variable soils. I've seen highly expensive soils in Tomball, and I've seen sandy soils in Tomball. You go to Woodlands, your soils are sandy, moderately expansive soils out there. Spring, real sandy soils out there. And uh, you go out there in Houston, West U, Bel Air, Tanglewood. You got highly expansive soils, big oak trees, and a bunch of attorneys. So you got to watch out there. This is a typical site out here. You got fat clay all the way down to 25 foot deep. You got a PI of 59, liquid limit here 80, highly expansive soils, strength of about 1,000 PSF all the way down to about eight feet, nine feet. Yeah. Below that, about 3,000 PSF. This is another site that's got all sand on it. And this one here is in Galveston, city of Galveston. And you can see sand all the way down here. You got sand all the way from loose to, you know, very dense. So we got clayey soils, sandy soils, silty soils. So if you want to build a structure and, you know, you got to, Clay layer at the top, below that you got a sand layer, below that you got a clay layer. If you got to use piers, you got to put them a certain depth. Uh, if your soils are expansive, you're going to have to go deep. If you've got non-expansive soils, your deep piers and spread footings can be shallow. Potential vertical rise. Potential vertical rise is expressed in inches. It's a potential ability of a site to swell at a, at a, at a specific site. This is based on Texas Department of Transportation, TEX 124E test procedure. It tells you for a specific site how much heave you want to have. So I developed a PVR for the Houston area. So your PVR, if you're out there near Kingwood, could be three to four inches. 
You go out there in, in Dayton, about four inches, five inches. You go to Crosby, five to six inches. Out there in Bellevue is about five inches. You go out there in Pasadena, five inches. Caroline, five, six inches. Big City, six to eight inches. Fresno, five inches. Missouri City, four to five inches. You go Richmond, Rosenberg, about five inches. You start going to Katy, about one inch, one and a half inches. Richland, one and a half inches, one inch. Fairfield, half, one and a half inch. Spring area, about one inch, one and a half inch. The Woodlands area. You go out here, interior of Houston, near downtown Bel Air, five inches. West U, four or five inches. So just depending where you are, you're going to have different types of movement. So you got to watch out this thing, you know, about this thing, because if you're building a foundation system, you got to be able to tolerate this kind of movement. PVR for most buildings on piers should be less than one inch. So some ways to reduce the PVR is put the sprinkler system all around the building, extend the grade beam down. The deeper your grade beam, the, the, the reduced amount of PVR you're going to experience. So some of these buildings, you put in concrete all around the building. That keeps the moisture from changing. So your PVR is not going to change very much. After initial movement, your building will stabilize. If you put planted areas, make sure you put them all around the building. You can't just put it on one side. Otherwise, it's going to flap. So you got a building here in the bank building in here. You got grass here. And then you can see here, you got this canopy in here. This area is going to move up and down because of the change in soil moisture. This area doesn't move as much because of the concrete cover. So you may develop cracking here. See the crack will happen here because this area moves around. This area does not. You put a skirt on some of your buildings out there. And to keep the movement from occurring, make sure you got positive drainage away from the building. You like to have at least five foot in 10, 5% in 10 feet, six inches in 10 feet on the grassy area, and at least 2% in concrete. When you use a slab on grade top foundation system, the waffle slab system or uh, slab on fill, Make sure you don't use sand underneath your building. Sand transmits water and causes heave. Do not use sand, use select fill. You can remove the expansive soils. You can put non-expansive soils. So if you've got a site with a PI of 60, active zone of 10 feet, active mo movement zone of, of uh, 10 feet, you need to as move as much as, uh, uh, as much as, Seven foot of soil for it to get the PBR to about one inch, which is uneconomical. Nobody does that. And if you use select fill, your select fill should look should have a liquid limit less than 40 and PI between 12 and 20. The type of foundation we use for our buildings, if they're like big box stores, we use drill piers. If you're in Galveston, you may use piling, auger cast piles, hilco piles or the smaller ones. Uh, maybe press piling and uh, uh, most of them on uh, small ones. If you're doing a small McDonald's or something like that, if you just use a conventional reinforced slab, if you're doing an apartment complex, you use a post tension slab, you can use a spread footings for like dealerships and stuff like that, or, or you know, some of these box stores on non expansive soils or mats, but nobody uses mats, but it's just be mostly spread footings. If you don't wanna have, you know, if you're building a building out there in highly expansive soils, you probably wanna go with structural slab with piers with a void, a crawl space underneath them, or a slab on fill supported on piers, because as you go down, the risk of movement occurs, so increases. So the least amount of movement occurs with a slab, structural slab with piers. Then you gotta have a slab on fill on piers. Of course, some people don't use that because of the flooding problem, so they need detention. Uh, so they don't use fill underneath the floor slabs. So they go with a crawl space. Uh, floating slabs supported on piers, uh, you can do that. The building can go up, but it cannot go down. Super slab, if you got a rush job, 
Uh, you can go with a super slab system, which is a waffle slab with great beams going into the natural soils and six inch concrete slab. So you don't require compaction. And the next one, of course, is a floating slab. Could be conventional reinforcing slab or a post tension slab. If I'm doing a uh, uh, <clears throat> the Wendy's, small Wendy's, I'll do a conventional reinforcing slab. If I'm doing an apartment complex, I do a post tension slab. Drill piers. So we go out there and I'm doing an HEB project. And uh, on this one here, or, uh, you know, we can have also a Home Depot. And these guys have tilt walls or CMU blocks. You're going to use piers. This is an auger rig. This is a drill rig, uh, reamer rig. You go out and then drill the hole. And uh, this is your reamer. You, this is the auger rig again in Sugarland. This is a reamer. You drill a hole out there and you open up your reamer. Make sure it opens up. You know, you got to get almost 80, 80 kips of loading on these tilt wall panels for a Home Depot. And so you're going to have to have a heavy load. So you're going to have to have a big, uh, big bell out there on these things. This is your hole in there. If there's water, you're going to have to remove the water. You can have up, up to three inches of water in the hole. You put your steel cage in there, steel. You pour the concrete, make sure it doesn't hit the sides. This is your pier. This is your bell. You bring the steel up. We don't recommend to bend the steel and tie it up to the grade beams. If you give, keep it straight, keep it straight and you put uh, plastic over it, this allows the grade beam to move up and down. And this is your piers. So we don't bend them in. Again, you can see your piers, your steel coming up. This is your grade beam. You don't uh, you don't bend the, the steel into the grade beam. You just bring it all the way up. There's void boxes. This is a project right here. That's the tilt wall panel project. And you can see the bells, piers in here. This is a perimeter tilt wall for like a Target store. And these are the columns and the slab is a slab on grade with a PVR of less than one inch. Again, you see the target out there. This is in the heights area. Uh, you got the CMU block in here and you got interior columns. So that's what it looks like. All the, this, the roof load goes to these columns. The way you determine your pier depths on these box stores, you got to know what your active zone depth is with the root fibers, for example. If this is the active zone depth right there where you got trees, your active zone depth becomes deeper. The way you determine your depth of active zone is you hit this when you hit a sand layer, when you hit rock, the lowest root fiber two foot below that, when the soil suction changes less than 0.027 pf, when your soil liquidity index become vertical, depth of slicking sides, yeah, slicking sides is where the soil you know basically um, <clears throat> got 45 degree cracks in it, and historical water table which is very hard to determine. So once you know your active zone, you know what your moving active zone is. I mean, this is moisture active zone is. Now there's a thing called the movement active zone. Movement active zone is equal to the moisture active zone or less, typically less. And uh, same as the zero movement line. The soils above the zero movement line experience shrink swell. The soils below it do not move. You got to put the piers in the ground and anchor it down below the zero movement line. So when the expansive soils wants to grab it, this is a downward movement. You got end bearing and skin friction to get to resist downward movement. But for uplift, which controls, you got the zero movement line, the soils above it want to heave up and pull your pier out of the ground. And then the soil below it, basically you have to anchor it down to skin friction to keep it down from moving up. If you put it right here, there's no resistance to the upward movement. So your pier is gonna move up and move your structure and your structure will fail. It'll be a floating foundation system. You don't count on the bell to resist uplift. By the time bell gets engaged uplift, you have moved already two, three inches and your superstructure is already cracked. So when you calculate your uplift due to expansive soils, you don't account for the bell. These are some structures out there in Pearland driving these sound walls out there, you're driving parallel, you can see the piers are going up. And uh, if they're too shallow, and that causes a lot of problems. And you can see this right here. So 
So you got to make sure your peers are deep enough. So if I've got a Chick-fil-A in here, I've got a soil with PI of 60, and my movement active zone is 10 foot, what is, what's the depth of my peer? If your rule of thumb is, if your active zone is 10 foot movement active zone, your peer depth is going to be 20 foot deep. Now I've got a Lowe's project going in with the PI of 50, movement active zone of 10 feet. What's my peer depth? About 22 feet, 23 feet. Because this skin friction in sand is lower than clay. So most of the time, so it has to go to more than twice, usually one and a half times of the movement active zone depth. So if I'm doing this thing in San Antonio lows in sand here below 10 feet, my pier is going to be 25 foot deep. So depending where you are, uh, uh, if you're in Houston, if your active movement, uh, active zone depth is 6 to 10 feet, your peer depth is 12 to 20 feet. In Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, your movement active zone depth is 15 feet. So your, uh, your recommended depth is 20 to 30 feet deep on in these areas. I'm looking at a 30-foot piers in Kaufman County that's moving. So just depending on where you are, you know, you got to put some deeper piers uh, on in these places, some places like Dallas, San Antonio, Austin. So depth of the movement active zone in Houston is about 10 feet. And in uh, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin is about 15 feet. In terms of the uh, uh, parking areas, uh, you know, you got concrete paving and all that and buildings. Uh, this is, again, this is another building in here. Uh, on, on this building, you got these columns coming in. You see the columns, this is a Kroger building, actually. These, these are what we call uh, footers or, or what we call uh, a good name for it. But they put the columns in these in these plastic kind of a rubber type thing in here to, to reduce the friction between the slab and the, and the concrete and, and, and the column. So uh, they call it boots. Okay, I remember just, they're called boots. On these boots, you put them in there, and, and this allows the, the movement between the slab and the column. Make sure you got your control joints at 15 foot spacing on your slab, on your big box stores. These are boots in here, you can see that. Or you can have joints like this, a circular kind that people use, diamond shaped joints. If you don't have joints out there, Cracking is going to occur between your columns and your floor slabs. So you're going to go out there and saw cut it and put it in. This is Walmart. They went out there and had to saw cut their joints in. On this one, they only saw cut one side of it. Then they didn't do the other side. So that was pretty cool. So I took a picture of it. So in the floor slab areas, if your soles are expansive, uh, if your soles are expansive, uh, you, the floor slab areas use a structural slab with void, or use a slab on fill, or you lime stabilize the on site material, or you do a chemical injection. If your soles are non expansive, uh, use proper compaction only. <coughs> you don't have to do any of the, the structural fill or voids or lime stabilization. Structural fill have a soil with the liquid limit between. 12 and 20, uh, and liquid limit of less than 40, PI between 12 and 20. Again, you can lime stabilize the on-site material as a green option for the architects. You can put that underneath your buildings. Structural slab, yeah, this is a Texas A&M project. They got this uh, school building going in. They want to go do with a call space type system. They put the piers in out there, and they got this Columns is a structural slab system. They run the plumbing underneath it. You got to be very careful with the plumbing on these buildings. I see a lot of buildings out there where you have highly expansive soils. The plumbing actually breaks. Actually, the plumbing pushes the bathrooms out, the, out of the floor slabs. So you got in highly expansive soils. 
make sure the, the plumbing is properly done. Again, this is a crawl space, crawl space type foundation. Here are the plumbing. That's a good system here. You can see just basically the plumbing hanging in there. You're not in contact with the highly expansive soil in here, which is in San Antonio. See how the plumbing is running? This is perfect. Now, if your plumbing is in the soil itself, that creates a problem. <coughs> Again, all these conduits and stuff like that, they got to have a void underneath them where the expansive soils are. Isolate the plumbing from the expansive soils. So this is the building out there in San Antonio. Structural slab on voids. So if you got a Costco out there, you got a highly expansive soil out there in San Antonio, a CVS, you can put void boxes underneath them under the slabs if you want to uh, have it, isolate them from the expansive soils. You've got to put void boxes in the great games as well. You calculate the void box size on the basis of the PBR. So if your PBR is six inches, you put in 12 inch void boxes. If your PBR is 10 inches, you put 20 inch void boxes. These are typical cardboard void boxes that deteriorate when they get wet. So here it says the void box thickness is twice the PBR. If the PBR is four inches, the void box is eight inches. These are the void boxes. They go inside the grade beams. These are the void boxes going in. Here's the void boxes underneath the foundation system. Void boxes between the piers. Again, void boxes in the floor slab areas. Isolate the piers. So it's very important to put these void boxes in. You put this cover sheet on top of it to, uh, they call it storm cover for protection. You put it in about there to prevent it from uh, basically a puncture. You put your vapor barrier on top of it. Then you put in your steel and all that. And this is the void boxes. You put your slab on top of it. Void boxes, you use your grade beam. Isolate the plumbing from the expansive soils again, uh, where you have these void boxes. It becomes difficult. We're seeing problems again with the uh, plumbing out there. Uh, if they're not properly isolated from the expansive soils uh, on these structural slab foundations or slab on fill foundations or foundations on uh, void boxes. Helical piles, if I've got a project that I want to get it done quickly, and uh, the cost of helical piles, these are steel piles. You just screw them to the ground. They're very quick. You can put one in, uh, put them all in in one day or, you know, like a jack in a box. You just drill a hole. This goes underneath your grade beam. You just drills on and just leave it in there. Here's a side in here. These are the helicals. And uh, you just drill them into the ground and leave them in there. They're very fast. Doesn't matter what your groundwater depth is, if you got sand, clay, uh, they're very good systems. They cost more than drill piers uh, when they're dry. They're cheaper than drill piers if they're slurry. You just put them in the ground, just zips in. These are helical pile systems. You just leave them into the ground. This is your beam in here. You put, you screw them into the ground and leave them in. These are the helical piles. Put your steel there, helical pile. You can have to uh, resist lateral loading. You drill a bigger hole, fill them up with concrete, and you put your uh, helicals in there. That gives you bigger surface area. This the, the the area you know maybe top ten feet is filled with concrete. Resist lateral loading or you put batter piles in. 
for Hillcles. You can see them out there going to great beams. Put void boxes in just like you do for piers. Put your steel in. Put your chairs. All get cast piles. Uh, you got a big box store and you got sandy soils like you're in Sugarland, Texas. You know, those some of these sites. You got to drill holes out there with an auger and you pump grout through it. So you drill the hole, you move all the soil. And there's a hole in, in the middle of this auger here. Soil spools come out and you pump grout through it. This is the head of it. After you put the grout in, you get the steel and just push it into the soil, into the uh, mortar, into the grout. On small jobs, if I'm doing a Wendy's, if I'm doing a small projects like a Taco Bell or a Canes, uh, Panetta Bread, or you know a uh, some you know uh, or something else, we just use something as a slab on grade system. It's a waffle slab. You got interior beams on it. Um, you got beams around the perimeters. These beams are at least twenty four inches deep. 12 inches wide, you put them about anywhere, depending on how expansive the soils are, anywhere from eight to, to 15 foot spacing. It's a cup, typical uh, waffle slab system. Make sure all the plumbing is nice and clean. This is not acceptable. They're gonna have to clean that plumbing, take out all the loose stuff out of there. It'll be nice and manicured. You put your vapor barrier in there. If the vapor barrier tears up, don't use duct tape. You got to use a special material. This is your beam in there with conventional reinforcing slab. Pump concrete out there. Make sure you got chairs underneath your steel. Again, you got that's your slab. Don't use welded wire mesh, rolled type. It ends up in the bottom. Uh, this is not acceptable. You need regular chairs underneath the steel. You cannot, this is not acceptable. You got to go finish it. This is not acceptable. You need chairs underneath the concrete. Otherwise, the seal is going to be all the way in the bottom, so you won't have any uh, tensile street tensile steel in the concrete. Your concrete can easily crack. You won't hold it together. This one here, this guy's here. They got the steel, and they've got uh, the sheeting on top of that, the membrane. Uh, moisture barrier, and then they pour the concrete on top of the membrane, so the concrete does not even hit the uh, the steel. It's a totally screwed up system. Spread uh, footing. If you got a hobby lobby type structure that you're going to put in, or a motel or something, if your soils are non expansive, you go in there and and you dig out your spread footings out there. These are square rectangular footings. You dig, and you put your steel in it. Or concrete. So, spread footing foundation system. If your soils are highly expansive for a slab on grade system type, uh, you want to get the PVR to less than 4.5 inches for some of these projects. So, if, if your PVR is high and you want to go a slab on grade system, you got to do chemical injection. That's one of the cheapest ways to handle it. Uh, basically, in expansive soils, we do chemical injection to minimize heave. And the way you do that is, of course, typical clay platelets, they have negative charges on them, and they absorb a lot of positive charge with water. And they absorb the water, and they become really expand, and they cause basically soil expansion, heave. So what you do is you reduce the negative charge by what's called ion exchange. And so you replace the sodium on potassium, you put calcium in there and reduces the, the negative charge. So basically this clay thickness of the double layer of the clay becomes a smaller. That's due to cation exchange. This is the chemicals you mix with water, basically. You inject chemicals in the, that in the tanks into the soil. In Houston area, you go at least 10 foot deep. In Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, you go 10 to 15 feet, depending on the soil conditions. 
you inject them all the way down into the soil. The chemicals come in and you just inject them at one foot intervals. And they're like 24 inches apart usually. So you inject them into the soil. This is an apartment complex in Houston. We're injecting that chemical injection to reduce movement. Uh, the soils where chemical injections are good are the soils where they got a lot of cracks in them. The more cracks, the water can travel better uh, in the areas where you got, uh, can, uh, you know, travel through the good clay soils. Parking drive facility areas, a lot of these box store projects, they got concrete paving or uh, asphalt paving. So you got to design for them. It's a salt grass there. They got a concrete paving there. Olive Garden concrete paving. Motel 8. Bank buildings. Your Walmart, they got a lot of asphalt. With CMU block construction. Walmart driveway. Sam's Club. An asphalt paving. Got Flying J. This is a... Uh, Service stations, we've got a lot of truck loading. They got asphalt, painting. No, you got a fuel max, you got a concrete paving. We designed these pavements based on Ashto ACI or Asphalt Institute pavement design. For parking area for concrete, we just use minimum of five inch concrete paving for parking areas. The truck parking areas, we go seven, eight inches thick. Driveways, at least six inches. And we do six to eight inches of stabilized subgrade with lime or lime flash, depending on the soil. Now, if I'm doing this job in Fort Worth, Texas, where they got high levels of sulfates, I don't do any stabilization of the soil. I just compact that soil and put paving on top of it. I may bump up the concrete thickness a couple of inches because that is no stabilization. So, uh, Again, and if you got asphalt paving for general parking area, use two inches of asphalt, six inches of base, six inches of stabilized subgrade. On driveways, truck parking areas, three inches of asphalt, eight inches of base, eight inches of uh, stabilized subgrade. And subgrade areas will be uh, stabilized with lime and flash. And uh, depending on the soils, again, if I'm in areas we've got high, high, high sulfate, Again, you cannot use lime or lime flash. You just have to bump up your pavement thicknesses. Like you use two inches or more asphalt or make sure you increase your, your base thickness. Dumpster pads, you know, most of the projects, they use concrete for dumpster pad areas. And uh, so, you know, there are areas that are asphalt. There's an asphalt one. So the dumpster pad, if you got concrete, I would use seven inches of concrete, eight inches of stabilized subgrade, three inches of asphalt or eight inches of uh, base, eight inches of stabilized subgrade. The stabilized subgrade could be lime or lime fly ash. In areas of high, high sulfate, uh, you have to design accordingly because you cannot stabilize. For your signs, you got these signs going in, the McDonald's, you got a Jack in a Box, you got a Walmart. They're all lined up here for these signs. These signs are, are subject to lateral loading, uplift, and the uh, moment. And uh, the way you design these things here, um, you got a big sign, small signs. Most of them are supported on drill piers. You can't put them on, you know, straight beams or spread footings because the wind loading would topple them over. So for some of these signs, uh, you gotta also design them. They got anchor bolts at the top. You gotta design them for lateral load, bending, compression, and uplift loading. These are the bending, compression, lateral load, and uplift. That's a McDonald there. We can use what's called L-pile design parameters, PY curves. When we design this thing, that's the PY curves right there, lateral load at load deflection. So we give you the L-pile design parameters, which includes, you know, the soil type, the range zero to two feet, soil modulus, E50, that's the soil strength, 
at 50% of the strength, soil, uh, soil strain at 50% of the strength, effective unit weight, undrained soil shear strength, angle of internal friction, your canopy structures when you do service stations, these canopy structures are subject to uplift, lateral load, and bending. And again, lateral bending, compression, and uplift, compression, uplift, lateral load. Again, use L pile. Then you got storage tanks. These tank excavation, you excavate the tanks with the backhoe, tanks excavations, and you put the tanks in there. You need to have a basically minimum excavation on the on 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 the excavation, minimum uh, slopes. Typically, minimum of one and a half to one, especially when you go below five feet. You got to have to use OSHA soil classifications. A lot of times, they don't go. They don't let people go in there, so they excavate it, and they fill it up with pea gravel. So you go out there and put your tanks in. And you start filling them up with pea gravel. You rot them, make sure they're nice and compact. This is your fuel tank area. You backfill the whole thing and you put concrete paving on top of it. Even if you're asphalt paving for the rest of the facility, use concrete paving and uh, on top of the fuel tank areas because of the, you know, the compaction of the pea gravel and stuff like that. So you're going to have to make sure you put concrete paving on top of it. Detention ponds, a lot of these are structures. Uh, they got these big detention ponds. So Walmart here, they got a 40 acre track. They got they need to have a big detention pond on it. It's Home Depot. Uh, you can see the detention pond there. This is the HEV. That's their detention pond out there in Magnolia. Auto, Auto Pond O'Reilly right there. They put the detention pond in the front. You know, small stuff, small facilities like O'Reilly, they got small detention ponds. You go to a movie theater here, they have a bigger detention pond. Like on a school project, you got a big detention pond. Uh, for detention ponds, you got to do slope stability analysis uh, to make sure your, your, your slopes are stable. Typically, if you got clay soils, you want to have a three to one slopes. Uh, <clears throat> on sandy soils, four to one slopes, maybe five to one. On um, you have to do conduct slope stability if you want to have a steeper slopes. Use uh, grass as erosion protection for most of these detention ponds. Uh, your building should be at least thirty feet away from your high bank of your detention pond. Otherwise, you have to do a different foundation system. Conduct slope stability, and the way you do slope stability is. You design the soil parameters for short term, long term, and rapid drawdown. Short term is undrained conditions during the construction. Long term, when the pore pressures or soils are dissipated. The rapid drawdown is when you get a big rain, the water in your detention pond goes up and it comes down. So the pore pressures are in the soil, so it reduces the effective stress strength of the soil. So you do a slope stability analysis for short term, it's like 2.5 factor of safety. 2.9. Here's a for uh, long term 2.2. This is a rapid drawdown 2.0. So rapid drawdown controls the slope stability. You need to have to have factors of safety against uh, slope failures. For short term is 1.3. Long term is 1.5. Rapid drawdown is 1.25. So it's very important to do proper geotechnical work on your box stores or your chain store. Uh, if this is your original design, if your building starts cracking, that's the change order right there. Uh, if you got some good pictures of the projects, please send them to me. I appreciate having pictures. Uh, this presentation is going to be on YouTube, uh, so you can go watch it again. Uh, thank you for joining us. There's a there's a basically a polling on this thing here that we're going to have, and uh, I want you. Uh, Let's see if I can launch the bow, uh, the poll. Oh, I don't see a launch in here. Uh, let's see. Poll. 
Yeah, I don't see a lunch in here. Vicki, can you tell me how the lunch is? It should be, like I showed you, the more. Okay, holes. Maybe it's launching and then we don't know. Uh, has anybody seen the poll launched? Let's see if you can see that. Oh, uh, no, there's no poll launched. So anyway, I hope you like it. Send me an email if you like the presentations. And if you want me to change the presentation anyway, I uh, appreciate y'all's time. Let's see. I just want to see what that was. Yeah, I don't see any lunch on this thing. We'll have to do. Yeah, I can't see. Uh, so, uh, let's see. If you need to reach me, my email, de at geoteching.com, 713-699-4000. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of webinars coming up. We're going to send you links on those things. You get continuing education. We're going to send it to you within the next few days. Questions? Anybody's got any questions? I know I went through this a lot of slides here. So if you got any questions, go ahead and ask me. Okay, let's see what we got here. Great presentation. Okay, they want to see the contact information again. Let's see if I can go back to the contact information. Um, here's my contact information. Anybody needs to reach me? Any questions? Well, send me an email if you want me to do modifications to this presentation. Uh, if you got, if you like it, tell me uh, you liked it. Uh, I surely like to get your feedback. There's a poll thing that doesn't work right now, but uh, send me your information. You know, email me and uh, let me know how how you like it and if there's anything I need to do to change it. Okay, actually, it actually works now that there's a poll. I just send it in. So please uh, respond to it. Let's see. Thank you for presentation. Put your contact as usual. Excellent. I appreciate presentations. Photos are great examples. Gary Boyd, no questions. Great, great presentation. Uh, somebody's asking, do you have an alternative to LPAL? Yes, there is alternative is a non-dimensional technique using elastic solutions for lateral power capacity calculations. You can use that, uh, a non-dimensional technique uh, or use a pools and Davis. These are two other techniques that uh, you can use. Uh, Randy Bauer, good presentation. Yeah, go ahead and respond to the poll and uh, let me know what you think. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate y'all's time. Answer those uh, poll questions and uh, let me know how you think. And uh, oh, I got another question. Okay, somebody else said this is fantastic. Okay, more is informative. Thank you for great presentation. We're good. So it sounds like it. Uh, a lot of people liked it. Well, thank you very much. This is going to be on YouTube again, so y'all can go watch it. Uh, and to keep us in mind, if you need geotechnical environmental material testing, we we'll also do forensics. So if your buildings starts having problems, parking lots, we can do all that too.